So, warm well, hello from my side as well. It's a big honor to be here. Uh, maybe first question: How many festival goers do we have here? Yay! Woohoo! Perfect. So, I hope uh, you can relate to some things. We'll see. And uh, yeah, what an honor to be speaking after Kiara and such a beautiful journey throughout the history of counterculture and um, such an inspirational talk. My focus is going to be. Uh, on festivals in a more broader sense. So we know that um, the qualities of the events can be very different. The degree of commercialization is very different. And so the intentions of the event organizers, they feed the results. And the results are that they are very different uh, worldwide, the festivals, but also in the UK. And um, Literally anyone who has put up a stage and has a sound system and sold tickets can call themselves a festival, and they do. And I think that it makes sense in kind of like our um, angle and perspective when we talk about psychedelics to look at the sum of these events, because um, especially nowadays, I mean, it has always been like that, right? So we've always gathered together to celebrate, to dance, to um, state our state, uh, to change our state of mind and our consciousness. Um, and obviously, psychedelic use does not only happen at psychedelic events. And so, if we talk about these kind of settings, and a lot of times we speak about. Um, Burning Man, which is not even officially a festival, or uh, really psychedelic gatherings, but um, I would like to say that, um, yeah, psychedelics are being taken everywhere, and especially nowadays, you know, we have Michael Pollan effect, we have um, psychedelics that have entered the mainstream media, so even more people are um, experimenting with these substances where they can really and where can they do it? Where can they afford them? This is in recreational settings, and so oftentimes also at festivals. And you know, I've kind of noticed that this good um, press pill that used to be an ecstasy in recreational settings nowadays is a juicy beef. So um, a lot of this psychedelic experiences, they're just entering all of these events. So let's take, uh, let's forget all these dreamy, beautiful, only psychedelic gatherings that we were just uh, talking about and kind of imagine the broader picture, so all the sum of all the events that are out there. And so uh, we just heard we're all experts here. There are a lot of experts on festivals. I am an expert too, and maybe um, to be able to bring across my inspiration for festivals as a setting quite generally. I do need to mention also my personal journey, but I will also be talking about the research that I've done. So what makes me an expert on this field of festivals? And you know, the very first event I went to it was a um, kind of dreamy, underground event near Berlin. And I just fell in love with like this whole setting as it is. Um, I was thinking, what is this phenomenon? These old people gathering together and just having this kind of shared experience and what is it? I need more of this in my life. And so I invited a lot more of this in my life. The seed for Reverglück was planted. So a few years later, my best friend and I went on this uh, really crazy journey. Um, so we did one festival every weekend for a year on six continents, so we, were, we just did that, video blogging about music festivals. And uh, it sounds a little crazy, but it was also, but it was basically one of the best years of my life. But what was thought to be a one-year project has transformed itself for me, so it actually never stopped. So my role has basically evolved and transformed and changed, but um, yeah, so Reva Gluck is in the past in terms of uh, video blogging, but it is not in terms of festivals and um, stuff. So we kept on going to events, and probably if COVID would have not happened, who knows, maybe we would still be doing this, but uh, COVID happened, and obviously as COVID had hit the, the world, it hit my world as I was at a festival uh, in, tribal, uh, in Panama, Tribal Gathering. And so, I don't know, if, have you heard about Tribal Gathering? Yes. Yeah, so almost three weeks at the beach in Panama, half naked, dancing, offline, and then so we turned our phones back on 
and realized, wow, I uh, can't really return home, so we got stuck in Panama for four months. So I accidentally lived in an eco-community, but that's a different story. I'm not going to go into this. Anyways, um, so, uh, yeah, since the pandemic, I contribute more to festivals, and I host workshops and talks, and I do a lot of side caring. So um, how many side carers do we have here tonight? Woohoo! Yeah, so take, uh, basically taking care of... Um, people in distress, mostly substance-induced. And so, all that being said, uh, at more or less 90 events in the past few years, you know, it's a bit blurry all now, so who is counting? But anyways, in those events, I have learned and witnessed that there's very different concepts. So, again, different degrees of commercialization. A lot of beauty, anyhow, always. Creative concepts, art, um, I made use of learning opportunities, right? So in a lot of times there are spaces to talk about things that are controversial, that are new, that are interesting, to get your hands on and learn how to do something. Um, I became aware of different sustainability concepts or their absence. Um, and I have experienced the closeness to the cultures of yeah, other countries in a way that is really in terms of this communitas and, and the belonging and the togetherness. And a lot of this um, connection is nonverbal. It's just, I think a lot of you will be able to relate with this, just kind of dancing and meeting someone eyes in, in, on the dance floor and realizing you're just vibing right now, kind of in the same way. And so, but also for me, um, those spaces are about conversations and about friendships. And so, just a few examples, I was talking about, you know, women, uh, women's rights with women in Morocco at a festival or um, Israeli soldiers coming back from their army time in Gaza. So, I learned these spaces, they're not like sterile environments, right? So, um, I'd like to say they're almost like a soup that is called, kind of cooked in the broth of the intentions of the events organizers, um, but then flavored with their very particular social, geopolitical uh, backgrounds and spiced with the legal framework. So I learned that, quite broadly speaking, festivals can be, they don't have to be, they're kind of like tools and it depends on how, what we make of them as well and, and collectively, but also almost like a container, and then the journey of everyone that comes to this. So they can be life-changing. They do speak to the very um, basic human need for thriving in terms of human connection, inspiration, or inspiring, oftentimes, loving life. Um, they promote catharsis. Um, they promote feelings of connectedness, togetherness, um, and cohesion. This is what we're talking about as well, communities, right? and then they represent microcosms of a microcosm of the complex world we live in. And so, um, as a setting, quite generally to me, they can combine different therapeutic elements. And that is presence and mindfulness elements. So I think a lot of you will relate with the fact that nothing brings you into this very now as these kind of events where all of your stimuli and everything is just like so crazy. And uh, yeah, practicing acceptance and non-judgment, um, very important, celebrating diversity. I feel like in those settings, the diversity and its value becomes very obvious, so how strong we are when we are so different. Um, and then music and sound therapy elements, um, art therapy elements, especially if there's a possibility for co-creation, which even starts for me with like uh, dressing up and maybe like thinking, what do I want to express and represent? Do I want to make people laugh? Do I want to look uh, like a certain persona, you know? So there's a lot of this kind of like subtle levels involved. And somatic movement therapy, I think a lot of us have danced through many things in life. Uh, potentially. So, um, what I'm also learning is that the festivals, quite generally, again in a broader sense, might be an endangered species, question mark. So, according to the uh, Association of Independent Festivals, 
Uh, there are a lot of them that have given up already since COVID and will disappear soon. But that is also not the topic I want to talk about more here. Um, I think I'm here to talk about psychedelics at music festivals. So um, to me, you know, <laughs> again, I think now you, you kind of feel my excitement for this setting quite generally. So having gone to all of these um, events in a combination of kind of like being sober and drinking alcohol and experimenting with different substances, it always felt like a journey, you know, so I would um, embark on a train on the platform number nine and go and it would be amazing, you know. But then at this, so during this Revaglu journey, one night I said yes to a very strong type of acid without having any idea what it's going to do to me, so I was absolutely psychedelic naive, but also psychedelics were not a part of my reality whatsoever. And so the subsequent 18 hours have changed my life trajectory completely. And um, it really felt to me like I have discovered the platform nine three quarters. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into detail here because I don't have that much time. But believe me, from this platform, there were a lot of more trains leaving for me. Um, some went to Hogwarts, some to hell. So it was very different all the time, but every time quite a journey. A hero's journey? Question mark. Um, you know, as humans, we really like to think uh, in models to make sense of our reality because it is complex. And um, in Germany, we say it's like cutting an elephant into slices, which is a bit of a brutal thing now that I think about it. But anyway, so this model of hero's journey can be one of the slices of the elephant to chew upon, if you'd like. Um, quite generally to kind of, yeah, make sense of the representation of how um, you go into this whole thing when it really takes it. So psychedelics being non-specific amplifiers and then amplifying this whole setting full of everything, right? So I really can relate to this one. And yeah, I've definitely been here before. Um, <laughs> or also there's a lot of archetypal, um, forces at play uh, in, in this journey, so maybe we can look at it as a fool's journey. And so, you know, starting with the fool, kind of entering the festival, arriving a bit naive maybe, but open uh, to explore, and then uh, facing various challenges, facing various uh, teaching presences, and hopefully evolving into the world, incorporating the learnings, whatever. So yeah, I'm not going to go deeper into this, because of the time, but I am around for chat, and I'm always happy to hear about your heroic explorations. And that being said, what I do want to talk about is my research. Um, so I don't really have kind of, please, um, it's uh, online, so it has been published as a paper in the Journal of Psychedelic Science um, earlier this year. Um, so I will just go really quickly through a few uh, key findings. It was a um, combination of qualitative and quantitative research. So I did an uh, online anonymous survey and interviews. And so the participants were, a lot of them were from the UK, quite a good bit. So it might not be as crystal clear for everyone why you would choose a festival at all as a, as a setting for your secondary experience. So here we go, some data, something to read. Um, and as you can see, a lot of this is evolving around fun, playfulness, just silliness and curiosity and exploration. And, you know, maybe that is just this antidote for, you know, just being here, just exploring and being as an antidote to our otherwise need to not just be, but be productive, be functionable in certain ways. And yeah, so not so many people said that they like to get high. I think it's because of the bad rep of this kind of expression. But I do want to paint, point out that if you really think about getting high, it's about changing perspectives as well. And I really like um, the link that Ali Biner has made in his book, The Bigger Picture, um, to the, you know, getting high or like the soul or um, spirit flight in a way. So that keeping in mind. 
um, the mere kind of fac factors that have um, that are distinguishing this setting from the other ones appear to be also the motivation why people do it. So, just want to quickly point out controllability versus non-controllability of the setting. So, this is something very beautiful I resonate with. Is so my participants were saying basically, if you kind of learn to navigate this territories at home by yourself, for example, then it's like theory, but then going out to the festival where everything is super unpredictable is like putting what you learned into practice. And it's like a game to play. Um, the diversity and richness of surroundings, quite an obvious one, pharmacological differences in terms of availability, accessibility of the substances, but also the mixture. So. Over 95% of my participants said that they would mix substances. And so, uh, which other setting invites um, alchemists to see what happens <laughs> if we take a pinch of this and then a little bit of that? And uh, yeah, ta-da. Anyways, um, community and connection, I expect, I think, very obvious one. But also, if you think here in comparison to other settings, if you are in an ayahuasca ceremony, you're most likely not going to see these people again, where there's uh, at festivals, you um, are there with your friends, new ones maybe, but then most likely it is your community that you're kind of keeping, that you're getting this level of bonding with that is absolutely unique. So I was asking people which nature of experiences they are having. And there's a lot of percentages here, so quite quickly, the greener the more, in a way. So you see the enjoyable uh, predominant, which makes sense, in a way. Um, I think what's important here is how common mystical experiences are. And I think this goes a bit contra the maybe general kind of like image of it's just to get, you know, whatever. So. Um, they are also mystical and profound experiences. Let's have a quick look into details. So enjoyable uh, ones, you're welcome to read through quickly, but um, I just want to say that they're great things that people are experiencing. And if you really think about it, an average young person in the UK nowadays, they live predominantly in the virtual world, right? So, or yeah, maybe enslaved by social media and really like filming themselves doing things and if they haven't, the experience hasn't happened. And then they go and do a self-checkout at the store and then they go to a bar and order or like to a restaurant and order online, although they're sitting in the restaurant and the food is being brought, so like very disconnected. And then um, maybe depressed, maybe having anxiety and maybe also for good reasons because uh, we're in the middle of the environmental crisis and, you know, the, there's a real danger of life being extinguished in the world. And we're in the middle of the mental health crisis and the cost of living crisis. And there's fake news everywhere and you don't know who to trust and you're confused and don't know whether to take life more or less seriously. So for them, these experiences might be more important than ever before. Also note how many of them are uh, over 50%. Looking at challenging experiences, compare here over 50%, which, yeah, I think anxiety is a very typical one kind of coming up. But yeah, so speaking about challenging experiences, um, I'd like to just point out that in a lot of times people uh, have, so it was kind of like an overarching theme that um, challenging experience it's still a very personally valuable one uh, because people kind of overcome things and it makes them stronger and so on and so forth. So I think this setting here is no different from others. That is not to say that bad trips don't exist. So definitely severe paranoia cases and um, also psychotic episodes are not particularly wholesome. Looking at mystical uh, psychedelic experiences at music festivals, um, just want you to yeah, so the basis for this was the um, mystical experience um, questionnaire. And I want to say that this is also important just from the perspective of assuming that this bit, that having mystical experiences is what l 
leads to potential changes, that that is an important um, uh, finding. So I only have two more slides. I'm going to be very, very quick. So this is maybe one of the core uh, findings is which um, worldview and behavior changes have been um, reported and they evolved around increased happiness levels, compassion, or trust in life, contributing to emotional balance, and a lot of uh, individually helpful realizations. So something that people understood for themselves that made it possible for them to go out and make that call to their sister, mom, whatever, to resolve the conflict that they have been having in their life. And there, there are a lot of uh, beautiful examples and um, trip kind of like reporty style, the quotes from the participants, so I can only encourage you to read it. And the last slide I, want, uh, I have picked is just uh, because this topic is very close to my heart, is uh, welfare and harm reduction services. And, uh, you know, I live in this bubble where I psych care a lot and like do all these things, and I think it's all normal, but actually, um, also keeping in mind that those psychedelic gatherings are kind of like the pioneering force on these grounds and have always led the way um, in terms of psychedelic care and harm reduction. Um, globally seen, the work is not done by far. Um, a lot of people have never heard of such um, services as care, for example. So in my study, uh, almost 40%. And uh, no such services or safe spaces are mandatory at festivals. And there is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about the way these services operate. So people are unclear whether there's going to be legal consequences um, and whether they're going to be judged and stuff like that. So my message here is definitely, uh, yeah, that uh, still a lot of emphasis need to, um, needs to be made on this because if we really, like, if there's one key t takeaway is that people take drugs at festivals. And it's a very simple statement, but it's like we all know it, but then we all kind of like pretend as if we don't. I don't know, it's like a very interesting um, situation we are at globally. And you know, these um, experiences, they influence their lives. And so if we were just to, and understanding the tricky situation of the event organizers, still there must be a way without kind of advocating for substance use to make sure that uh, everything is done so that the experiences can be safe. And those are substance, you know, things come in mind as substance testing, uh, mandatory wealth and harm reduction services, mandatory safe spaces with reduced stimuli so that, you know, you don't have to wait until things go wrong education, preparation, support before the festival, and integration post-festival. So a lot still can be done. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's the last shout out to Other Trust and Psycare UK. Thank you.